John Barber is a multi-Emmy winning godfather of reality TV and acclaimed filmmaker who redefined the narrative surrounding JFK's assassination, leaving an incredible mark on American television by interviewing legends like Frank Sinatra and challenging the boundaries of media with his critically acclaimed works. And John is on the line with us here. How are you today? Well, Toby, I am so, so thrilled to be talking to you. You because I have an enormous, enormous affection for the British. Because in 1960, I spent a year over there. Because in 1939, when my father left our, uh, I came from a severely dysfunctional home long before it was popular, and he thought it would be easier to fight the Germans than to fight his wife. <laughs> yeah. And and then he stayed over there. He got the Order of the British Empire. Became a very successful. Successful um, advertising salesman in Scotland. So I tracked him down in 1960. I discovered him. Unfortunately, we didn't get along. But on the way back from Scotland to London, I read an ad in a newspaper saying they were looking for actors for a place called the Castle Theatre in Farnham, Surrey. And I auditioned and I got a part and I was there for almost a year. So I loved it. And then four years ago, my son is the executive producer, and one of the head writers of an American show called Criminal Minds. I don't know if they get that in England or not, but we are both avid golfers. So four years ago, he took me back to Scotland where I played St. Andrews. So I am more than delighted and even honored that you would want to be talking to me about my third and final film about the murder of John Kennedy. And it's called John Barber's and William Shakespeare's Last word on the murder of JFK. So I'm delighted and delighted to be with you. Yes, and it's great to have you here. And we'll talk about your final JFK film shortly. But first of all, one of your documentaries, The Garrison Tapes, has been hailed as a companion piece to Oliver Stone's film, JFK. So what was the process of creating that film and how did you kind of get interested in making the JFK films originally? Toby, all of the magnificent, wonderful things happened to me by accident. When I left Canada when I was 17 years of age and I, I was deported twice from the United States, I was unemployed in this country when I was 46 and in 47, uh, when I was 47, and I had the number one show in the country. But there was a morning show uh, called the AM show. It was a news show on, on the ABC affiliate in Los Angeles. And the reason the show came about is because they had been playing a lot of movies and cartoons. And there were 20,000 Mexicans and Chicanos protesting that they were not being represented by uh, American television in Los Angeles. And they challenged the license. So they decided to do a morning show. And I was the one that, strangely enough, got the job as the host. And I had taken little or no interest in the murder of John Kennedy. I mean, I just wanted to be the best co host I could for this show and the best father I could be for my 12-month-old son, Christopher, at the time. Although it was all over the news, I did, of course, re read Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment. And by the way, what most Americans don't know is that Rush to Judgment was turned down by every publisher in the United States. And it was only Bertrand Russell who got it published, of course, in England. And it became such a monster hit, he was only paid $1,500 that they brought it into this country where it became a bestseller. Anyway, one day I'm in a bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard and I see this book called Heritage of Stone. And the title, uh, under the title is the author, Jim Garrison. So Toby, I pick it up and I just started perusing through it. And I see information in this book brought up at the Clay Shaw trial that was never in the American mainstream media. I mean, he had to sue Time Life to get that famous Pruder film just to show the jury. And then there was a 
pro- forensic pathologist named Fink who said there was never an autopsy. They were prevented from doing it by a bunch of generals in the autopsy room. So I thought, oh my God, what a great story. So the next day I call uh, the uh, uh, DA's office in New Orleans and this bass baritone voice answers, says hello. And I said, hi, could my name's John Barber. Could I please speak to uh, Mr. Garrison? And this beautiful voice said, this is he. And I got all excited. I said, oh, Mr. Garrison, I just read your heritage of stone. And he chuckled and he said, oh, you must be the other one. Only sold two copies. (laughs) You couldn't, you had to love a guy like that when actually it was bestseller. So I had told him about our show and that I was just loved to have him on the show to talk about his case. And he said, John, you'd never get away with it. Have you ever seen me on national television in spite of it being the most famous murder case in the history of America? And I said, no, sir, I have not. And he said, well, you'll never get away with it. And I said, hey, hold it. I just won my first Emmy. And he chuckled again. You plan on winning some more? (laughs) Which I did, by the way. (laughs) So we spoke for about a half an hour and a lot of it was about his favorite author William Shakespeare and that made him feel comfortable because in the book Heritage of Stone a lot of the titles are quotes from William Shakespeare so he decided to come on I booked him and I was fired. Wow. But Toby, I didn't think it had anything at all, nothing at all to do with the fact that there was a conspiracy to to murder the president. As a matter of fact, um, it was a conspiracy case that the major news told America that Jim Garrison had lost. But the conspiracy case was not his most important case. His most important case was the case of perjury against Clay Shaw, which he won. He had 87 witnesses to the fact that Clay Shaw was with Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry, and they were planning an assassination of John Kennedy. But the federal government again stepped in and stopped that prosecution. But there is absolutely no doubt that he solved that case. Now, what happens is that I I forget about that for a long while. And we did talk occasionally because I became Frank Sinatra's private writer for four and a half years. And if you go to my site, www.johnbarbersworld.com, you will see when Sinatra hosts The Tonight Show, he has me come on to do a stand-up because I was a very successful comedian. And uh, a lot of people used to poo-poo Garrison about, geez, how can you pick John Barber to be your Boswell over Oliver Stone to tell your story in some documentaries when he was a comic? And Jim Garrison, it oh, there could be no better choice than a comedian because the sickest joke ever played on America was the Warren Commission. So in any event, on his deathbed, deathbed he chose me over Oliver Stone to be the Boswell to uh, tell his stories. But anyway, after I did the monologue on the uh, Tonight Show with uh, Francis, I got a call and it was from Jim Garrison, who just loves some of my jokes and some of my my comments. It was a time of Watergate. And I said that Watergate may be one of these events that may put America on the brink of democracy. He absolutely loved that. And then he bored some of the other lines. And during Vietnam, we chatted a little bit, but especially over Watergate. We only became pals over Watergate. And when we talked about Watergate, he talked about all the names involved with Watergate that were also involved with the murder of John Kennedy. And after we did that for about 45 minutes, he wanted to talk more about William Shakespeare. Now, 1992, uh, uh, when I got real people on the air, Toby, I was dubbed the godfather of uh, reality television because real people was by far the most successful and most historic and original television show in the history of America. Half of every person in America or half of every set was tuned to that that show, that incredible show. 
So while I was doing that show, I read uh, on page 13 of the LA Times that they had found a dictabelt. It a motorcycle officer, H.B. McLean, had a dictabelt open and it recorded four shots. So they had to determine that with four shots, there had to be a conspiracy. So I called Mr. Garrison and asked him if he felt vindicated. And he said, John, I feel like a blind man who got a small trophy in a very dark room. Only I know I got it. So I said, well, I'm going to come down there again and I'm going to tell your story. He said, John, I haven't talked to anyone about this case since Clay Shaw, but I'd be more than happy to tell you. So in the attempts to tell this story again on the most famous historic television show in American history, which I had created and produced, a year after I was unemployable in this, I told you at 46, I was unemployed. And at 47, I had this show. I again was fired and I lost it. And so, but getting to the documentary, Oliver Stone, I, it was September 5th, 1981. Isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah. you remember when John Kennedy was shot November 22nd, 1963, I remembered the three hour interview I did with Mr. Garrison in New Orleans, September 5th, 1981. Most magnificent, terrifying, uplifting, heroic interview I had ever, ever spent in my life. And why? I, when I asked him, since he was so independent, he wasn't aligned with, it wasn't a, he wasn't a Democrat, he wasn't a Republican, he never tries to raise money. He was just so popular, they kept voting him in. And I asked him, why did you ever think, Mr. Garrison, you could take on the federal government? And he said two things, Toby. He said, I guess as a kid, I saw one too many Frank Capra movies, which is, which is me, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And then the other heartbreaking line, he said, I guess I thought I was still living in the country I was born in. Anyway, Oliver Stone buys his book on the Trail of the Assassins. Uh, for $50,000 and decides to make the film. I have three and a half hours of the original. So I call Oliver's office and I say, listen, I have the original. It's not Kevin Costner. And how would Oliver like to be an executive producer? Well, I do this film, which we will call the Garrison Tapes. And of course, I'll have I'll be in charge of it because that's what Mr. Garrison wants. And they declined. Absolutely. Not only declined, but somebody at uh, Oliver Stone's office called uh, Elizabeth Garrison. And Jim Garrison was on his deathbed at the time. His daughter was speaking for him. Somebody called and said, don't ever do dis business with John Barger. Barbary has a very bad reputation for being uncontrollable and too controversial. And don't do anything with him. So I asked Liz, I said, what did your father say? And very plainly, even on his deathbed. And by the way, if you also go to my site, www.johnbarbersworld.com, quite, I barely remembered it. But on his deathbed, before we went out to shoot one frame of film, he called me. And you can listen to his deathbed conversation with me for 19 minutes. Minutes, and if it doesn't bring you to tears, you are not you are not human. So in any event, we go out and make the film, and it's a monster success. Great reviews, even in the mainstream media. But uh, I am denied an Oscar because my partner, Freddie Weintraub, who brought Woodstock to Warner Brothers and who brought Bruce Lee Kung Fu to Warner Brothers, he said that what I had was the political Woodstock and we would be uh, we would become mega millionaires. And if I got, I said, the first money I get, Toby, is going to go to a scholarship for Jim Garrison at Tulane University. Now, this may sound cruel to you. On the 60th anniversary, John Kennedy is dead in this country. And I hate to tell you this, he is long, long forgotten, and only a handful of us even care. But the most important person, Toby, is Jim Garrison, because he was the only law enforcement officer in this country who stood up to prove that in the United States, nobody should be above the law. But if you know anything, 
saying about American politics now, you know that's the biggest load of crap that's been dumped on the American people, so much so it could fill up the Grand Canyon. There's almost everybody of substance in the media and government is above the law. You know, they you know, every time that Donald Trump is arrested, he uses that arrest to go out and raise millions of more dollars to help support him in his in his cause. You know, and uh he his mugshot has gone on cups and saucers and plates. <laughs> And made him about $14 million. And I look at everyone in the American government, from Joe Biden to everybody in Congress, everybody in the Senate, and everybody in the media. And I think every single one of them is so crooked, they should all have mug shots. Anyway, I didn't mean to dominate this conversation. <laughs> yes. I wanted to talk to you. So go ahead and ask questions. Yes. Please. Well, your latest third and final docu presentation, John Barber's and William Shakespeare's last word on the murder of JFK, is being screened on the 60th anniversary of his assassination. So, what can we expect from this final instalment? Well, it it is for me, Toby. It is the final instalment because it, the really interesting thing to me about the film, and by the way, you can see you can see the first film, the Garrison tapes, for nothing on my site. The second film, which is called the American Media, and the second assassination of President John F. Kennedy, will outlast Oliver Stone's movie and every one of the great books ever written about this. It will be around 100 years from now. Nobody compete, can compete with the genius of Jim Garrison's storytelling or the proof that he brings in that film, and it only costs $2. Now, the third one I call John Barber and William Shakespeare's last word on the assassination. And the interesting thing about this 85-minute film, it tells a parallel story to Toby. It's the story of my 53 years of trying to tell Mr. Garrison's real story on American television at an enormous professional cost to me and a financial cost. I've spent nearly three quarters of a million dollars of my own trying to tell these stories. But in this last one, aside from the 53 years I'm trying to tell Mr. Garrison's story, there's the parallel story of me trying to live a successful and productive and creative life in American television by, and while raising a family. So it's extremely extremely compelling and it ends with my going back to my days at the Castle Theatre in Farnham, Surrey when I am pursuing my father unsuccessfully I mean I met I, I meet him I meet up with him but we did not get along and then talking about the Castle Theatre and my experience uh, as Hamlet so it it's it's and I don't I'm a, I have it for a week at a place called the Town Center Theater Five in Encino, California, and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it after that. I may put it up to be a companion piece with the American media, or I may just put it up on Facebook. But I have not been successful. I, I the first film was a slam dunk Oscar, but my and all the monies that they came in from the DVDs, hundreds of thousand dollars was stolen by Freddie Weintraub. And then he sold the uh, garrison tapes to Cinemax for just one screening for $100,000. And that went into his pocket. And then he died. And there's no way I could get that money back. So the money that I was going to put up for a scholarship disappeared. As a matter of fact, when I announced that the first money would go to a scholarship, I only heard, got three words from Oliver Stone. He said, count me in. Um, but when my second movie came out, which supports everything he says in his film. He has not once said an encouraging word about that, even though the first one he said is a perfect companion piece. Instead, he makes a guy named James Douglas a mega millionaire by endorsing his book 
called The Unspeakable, which is almost unreadable, and it costs $48 to read, and it takes two and a half weeks to read, when my film is only $2 and and takes two hours and 10 minutes to watch. So I am doing all of this on my own, and what I say at the end of the film, you know, John Kennedy asked what you can do for your country, and so what I could do for my country, which is not the same country I became a citizen of, to quote Jim Garrison. He said, it's not the country I was born in. It's not at all like the country I came in into. And uh, you can read all about that. I have an autobiography out, Toby, called, and I'd love it to send it to you if you read anything at all. It's 752 pages. It is the best book ever written by anybody in show business. And it's called Your Mother's Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times of the Canadian Dropout Who Changed the Face of American Television. And the the title came about because of Jim Garrison. When I was booking him, it was just a few years after the Warden Report, and he said, this is the first time on the AM show, he said, um, John, do you know that 82% of all Americans, even four years after the Warren Report, do not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald either did it or acted alone? And I said, well, why aren't people storming the barricades of bullshit in Washington? And he laughed and he said, well, John, you didn't see the second question in this survey. And I said, what was that? He said, the second question in the survey asked of hundreds of Americans was, would you like to see a deeper investigation into the murder of John Kennedy in which both the FBI and the CIA were questioned and interrogated? And he said, what do you think the answer was to that? And I haven't, I said, I haven't got the foggiest idea. (laughs) He said, 22%. Then he says, now what does that tell you about us as Americans? And this is how I replied. I said, Mr. Garrison, I know what my mother and father did on the card table or the pool table in the rumble seat of the car or in the bedroom to concede me. But do not ever tell me my mother is not a virgin. Well, he howled. He said, John, my God, he sounds like something Mark Twain would say. And he said, Mark Twain is my sacred favorite writer. He had a bunch of quotes from Mark Twain. One said that if that hundred years ago, it said, if you do not read the press, you are uninformed. If you do read the press, you're misinformed. Isn't that brilliant? And Mark Twain also said, Toby, I ask you this. Do you have a cat or a dog? Do you have a cat? I used to have a couple cats. Okay, well, you'll know this. They say that dogs have uh, masters and cats have servants. And, yes. And Mark Twain said the difference between a cat and a lie is that a cat only has nine lives. A lie lives forever. My God, just genius. No wonder no wonder Jim Garrison liked him so much. But if you would like a copy of that book, I am telling you, I'd be thrilled to send an autographed copy to you. It is an unbelievable, great read. It's as good a read as are the these films to watch. Absolutely. You've had an incredible career, of course, in television and winning multiple awards. But what we really want to know is, do you have any anecdotes from your time working with comedy legends like Lenny Bruce and George Carlin and Rodney Dangerfield? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, in my book, I have a a whole chapter about all of the comics that you just mentioned. And they were all friends of them them all, every single one of them. But Red Fox was my mentor. When I was starting as a comic, uh, my wife uh, was a band singer, big band, and Earl Father Hines, who used to be in the Louis Armstrong quartet, quintet, started his own big band, and my wife became uh, the singer and became friends of both Dick Gregory and Red Fox. And my very first album, which was encouraged by Red, which you can also also see, you can get it on YouTube, is called It's Tough to Be White. It is, now that came out in 
1966, and it is more topical in America today. And of course, they got very nervous about releasing it. But at the time, Dick Gregory was by far the most successful black comic in America. And he said, he called and he said, John, I'm going to do the liner notes for you. So he did, did the liner notes. The album came out and was very, very successful. The second album I did was based on the years I spent as a critic, and it was called I Met a Man I Didn't Like. And then Joan Rivers and Paul Williams and Burt Reynolds and Neil Simon did the line of notes on that. Now, when I got my first talk show, I was the first one to put Red Fox on entertainment television. Because I'm sure if you know anything about Red Fox, he had to make a living working the Chicklin service. Circuit. And did you know that his best friend was Malcolm X? Did you? Yes. If you go to my site again, oh, bless you. If you go to my site again, you can Google a red fox. When uh, Dean Martin uh, had his roast, uh, I was the first one that red fox called to have me roast him. You can see me roasting him there. But most of all, you will see a half a dozen unbelievable interviews from either eight minutes long to 45 minutes long with Red Fox. And people wouldn't put him on television because he thought he was filthy. Well, he was filthy, but he was funny, and that's how he earned a living. But he was all, he was the best ad libber I ever knew, clean. And the two best, of course, were Jackie Mason. You know the name Jackie Mason? I don't know. Oh, Oh my God, he used to be a rabbi. <laughs> and uh, he became a comic. And it, well, what I remember his opening line. He sort of talked like this, you know, he talked like he was really Jewish. That was his accent. But I remember the first line when he got on the Ed Sullivan show. He said, I'm so secure. I go to a football game. I see them huddling. I think they're talking about me. I mean, that's the first line. But anyway, Red Fox, I book him on my show because when he was talking about Mr. Garrison and I kept saying he's America's greatest hero. And Red Fox said, heroes ain't born. They're cornered. And that was so true because when I repeated that to Mr. Garrison, he laughed and he said, it's true because I believed the Warren report. I was in the military. I was in the FBI. I don't know my government is going to lie to me until an accidental meeting with Hale Boggs, the only dissenting member of the Warren Commission, who said it would be impossible for Lee Harvey Oswald to fire those shots from that old man with Carcano. And not only that, Hale Boggs went before Congress, it's in the congressional record, and said there has to be a new investigation into the murder of John Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And then he got on his private plane, which crashed in Alaska, and they never found it. And guess who drove him to the airport, Toby? Who? Bill Clinton. Wow. Yes, yes. I mean, the, the stories are anyway. But anyway... I put Red Fox on my show and he was, can I tell you a joke that he said that got the second biggest laugh in American television and it's clean, but sensitive, but it's clean. Can I tell you? Of course. Okay. It was a time of the black power movement in this country, late, late sixties. And I asked Red, I knew what his act was all about. So I knew what he was going to say. I asked him about what he felt about black power in this country. And Red says, I don't care about black power or white power. And I said, you don't? He said, no, I only care about green power because if you have the money, you can buy the places where the whites and the blacks hold their meetings. Of course, it got a big laugh. Now, I don't know why I said this, and I hope I was hoping I wouldn't upset him. Out of nowhere, I said to him, Toby, hey, Red, why do you think money's colored green? And without missing a beat, he says, that's because Jews pick it before it gets ripe. People 
were falling on the floor. It took forever to get the show started again. And Jack Carter, who was a famous comic at the time, was one of our guests also. So when it got very quiet, he'd take out his wallet and take out $20 bills and start waving green power around. It was just hilarious. But his name is John Sanford. And that's why they, that's why they call. But the show was originally one of your country shows, So and Son. Yes. And it was taken by Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin and turned into Sanford and Son for Red Fox and became a monster, monster hit. And sadly, sadly, I mean, uh, do you know the name Matthew Perry? Okay. When I was in uh, Hollywood, John Perry, his father, uh, was a terrific actor. And have you ever heard of the name Bo Swenson? He was a very, well, he he was a, a major star. He did Waldo Salt, uh, uh, co-starred in that film. And then he was the major star in Walking Tall. He became one of the biggest box office stars in the world. So the three of us started what's called the Celebrity Hockey Team, which is still going strong. And you can find pictures of that on my Facebook page. But in any event, um, John Perry was doing everything he could for his ambitious young son who wanted to be an actor. And his son, even at a very young age, was a screw-up. And now he ends up getting into a magnificently written show called Friends, a magnificently cast show. It becomes a monster hit in the United States. Now, do you know, Toby, what the odds are of any actor in this country getting a part like that in a television show oh probably very very low a billion to one and he ends up putting seven million dollars worth of cocaine up his nose so i posted that i had very little empathy for matthew perry but my heart breaks for his father john who was and is a dear close friend well the same thing happened to red fox only he put more of his of it success success didn't go to his head it went to his nose and it broke my heart and he moved up from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. He said he wanted to be near me and my wife because there was a time when he quit Sanford and Son and he's making $25,000 a year. And publicly, he's calling Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin cheap Jews. And I said, hang on a second. When you were working the Chetlin Circuit, you were lucky to make $500 a week. You go back and keep doing that show because it's a magnificent show. And I don't care what national nationality these two guys are they're talented and they're paying you twenty five thousand dollars a year and making you one of the most famous people not only in this country but in the world but he didn't go back he ran away from nbc and he hid out at our house and then he asked me if i would help him draft an agreement for him to go to abc which we did and of course not only is the rest history but the rest is horrible bad luck because because he said, I want to produce something. And I said, you're, you can't produce anything, but you're a brilliant stand-up comic. You're a brilliant comic actor. If you were producing something, you would have done it a long time ago. Just continue to be an actor in a comic and you'll own the world. But he didn't. It, a, lot of, a lot of them are self-destructive. Self well, what are you working on at the moment? Are there any more films or anything? I know you say this is the third and final JFK film, but is there anything else outside of that that you'll think you'll do? No, because what I have said, this is, uh, I do a lot of on-camera what you call rants about politics and they're usually very funny. Have you ever heard of a comedian named Bill Hicks? Oh, Bill Hicks was made a rock star in England. He could barely get work in the United States, but in your country, he was an absolute rock star. You should Google him. He's, they, he was so big, he was invited to perform at Oxford University. You can get that. I think it's 60 or 90 minutes long. Bill Hicks at Oxford University. He'll blow you away with how brilliant he is. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, he's very obscene. He's very vulgar, but it's funny and funny yeah. is, and funny is funny. But his political observations are great. Well, I don't I don't do filth I, because I'm, I, I was brought up in, in an age when you didn't do filth. So I don't. 
but I do I do write great jokes, and they are in in my rants. And uh, I I I yeah, for and I did great great jokes about Trump, which cost me a lot of viewers, but won me won me a lot of viewers. You know, when everybody was uh, well in the United States since 1917, the American government's been trying to destroy the Soviet Union. There's no question about that. And after the Second World War, as Jim Garrison said, that was the first fake Cold War because Russia lost 25 million people and 75 percent of their infrastructure. It was all a fake war. And uh, so in any event, uh, when they started attacking Putin again uh, recently, I said, uh, we've just discovered that Putin is a liar because he called Trump a genius. (laughs) And then the last joke I wrote is because... He, he has been censored and fined in the civil courts in New York City and may never be able to build a house or a building or do building in New York City for the rest of his life, just from what's happened now. I mean, but there are federal charges still being brought against him. And so what I did is I got a, very, a picture of a very large cardboard box. It's about seven feet by seven feet, and the top is wide open. And underneath, I write, this is Donald Trump's next New York home. And he's already had it appraised at $18 million. Now, that may not be funny to you, but that's funny to Americans because one of the reasons he's being charged with federal crimes is because he overstated the value of every one of his properties when he was trying to raise and borrow money and yet deflating the value of every one of his properties when it came to paying his income tax. You know, his lawyer, uh, Michael Cohen, you've heard of his lawyer? Oh, yeah. Okay, Michael Cohen, the day he went to jail, and he went to jail quickly for two reasons. He paid a multi-million dollar fine, and he said the reason he was going to jail is that if he did not go to jail, the IRS and the government said they would bring charges against his wife. So he didn't want his wife to go through that. And the day that he paid his $3 million fine for back taxes, Donald Trump paid $700. And one of the greatest geniuses ever to come out of your country, John Lennon, said of the United States of America, and it's in the film, I think this country is being run by a bunch of lunatics. So so there you go. Where can we find all the stuff you've done before? And of course, see this latest JFK film when it comes out. I don't know about the latest, but what I said at the end is John Kennedy said, ask uh, ask what you can do for your country. I have run out of ways to help Jim Garrison. And when in 1960, when John Kennedy became president, he said, it's time for the next generation to take over. So I'm leaving it to the next generation to maybe create a scholarship for Mr. Garrison, because we need a Jim Garrison much more than we need a president. We need Garrison ever more than we ever needed John Kennedy or even Thomas Jefferson, because he's the only one who could stand up to the Lyndon Johnson thieves and crooks of the world. And so that's where I'm lefting, leaving it. But if you go to www.johnbarbersworld.com, you will have a field day going through all these interviews with Mr. Garrison, all these documentaries about Mr. Garrison, and then the stuff with Sinatra, the stuff with Red Fox, the stuff with Paul Williams and Burt Reynolds. I mean, I interviewed all these major stars, and most of the stars I interviewed, like Burt Reynolds, call me to come on to be interviewed on my show after I bombed their movies. And it's be- and Frank Zappa, hundreds of thousands of people watch these, and I'm thrilled that they do. So, you know, listen, I'm 90, okay? <laughs> so 
And I'm not running out of juice, you know. People ask me what keeps me going, and I say rage and laughter. Because in this country, which is totally falling apart, the things that you can rage at are the absolute same things that you can laugh at. And so I just, I am so thrilled to talk to you because when I went there in 1960, you know, I had never seen a Charlie Chaplin film because they wouldn't show Charlie Chaplin movies in this country because he said he was a comic. The greatest artist ever in the history of movies, Charlie Chaplin. So when I was there and at Piccadilly Circus at the theater there, they had a week-long festival and I was in it from morning to night, seven days a week, watching every one of Charlie Chaplin's films. So God bless the British Empire. (laughs) What's left of it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, many thanks for talking to us today it's been great to have you on the show oh toby thank you that was that's really heartwarming you know